Coming up on Tech Thing, nervous about C Cleaner? We've got an alternative. Logitech's Craft Advanced Keyboard gets reviewed. What happens when a hard drive dies in your NAS box? Building a video editing PC and quite a bit more. All coming up on Tech Thing. Thank you, patrons. Without your support via patreon.com slash tech thing, we wouldn't be able to make the show for you each and every week. Join the crew that makes Tech Thing possible at patreon.com slash tech thing. Thanks. I'm Shannon Morris. And I'm Patrick Norton. And this is Tech Thing, where we have something useful in every single show. And some days we have exciting news. Ooh. In fact, look at these. What is Oh, so that is called an Ultimate Ears Roll Speaker. Close. Yes, I'm familiar. I've they look one like, of those. I thought they were digital pet rocks, but according <laughs> to Droid Life, these are the Google Home Mini, the small oh. $49 Google Home. Oh, ho, really? Hmm. Yeah, so Interesting. October 4th is the big mobile thing from the Google yes. kids. So October 4th, we will probably find out if there's a Pixel 2 as well, which probably there is going to be one, and <laughs> it will most likely not have a headphone jack either, which I'm super looking forward to. Can you tell? Can you tell how excited I am about the new Pixel not having a headphone jack? Mm. Speaking of not having a headphone jack, early reviews of the iPhone 8 and 8 Plus are out. Uh, Nile Patel over at The Verge has a really nice round that basically says, if you got an iPhone 7, don't bother. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. The iPhone 10, however, people are very excited about. Yes, the iPhone yes. 10 looks really cool. The iPhone 8 is basically the same as the 7? Yeah. With a few sm slight increases? For, for my like iPhone 6-ish phone, I would be tempted to get the cameras on the iPhone mm. 8 Plus. Okay, got it. Tempted. 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 <laughs> right. But the VIG on the 256 gigabyte version is a little steep for mm -hmm. me. Well, moving on, we got some pretty exciting news about CCleaner. Actually, it's pretty upsetting, to be honest. So CCleaner is having this huge week of headaches. Uh, CCleaner, if you didn't know, it's an optimization tool for Windows machines, and we've also highly recommended it plenty of times in the past. The free version turns out it's 5.33.6162, that specific version, and CCleaner Cloud 1.07.3191, both of those for 32-bit Windows machines uh, that were distributed between August 15th to September 12th were infected with malware. That's what Yay. this phase is about. Yeah, exactly. So the malware was included in the application before it was actually compiled, which also... This is what? just like, well, it's just like... Uh, it, it I should just let him stand there. <laughs> uh, no, I'm just, I'm just, it, yeah, it, the fact that someone got so far in to the C Cleaner production that they basically inserted code yeah. into the code before folks, it was. Folks are suspecting that it's either an inside job or somebody was fished that works at C Cleaner. Uh, so what happened was the malware was included in the application before it was compiled. Yeah. That also allowed it to have a valid certificate from Symantec so nobody caught it. C Cleaner 5.33 was available on their legitimate first party servers, not yeah. third party, not mirrors or anything like that. They're legit servers and they got downloaded a couple million times by different users. Right. Now, if you have the newer version, which is 5.34, that one does not have the malware and it is available now. So if you want to keep CCleaner, you should definitely update the software immediately if you have yeah. not done so yet. And, you know, especially in the wake of Equifax and so many other breaches we've seen in the last couple yeah. of years, props to CCleaner for being like, whoa, um, yeah, download the fixed version right now. Yeah, and they here's why. <laughs> yeah, they got a fix out pretty pretty quickly as as soon as they discovered the problem. Uh, so for more details on the malware mm -hmm. and exactly what it did and how to keep yourself secure, you can check youtubecom hack 5 That's where I've done my newest episode of Threatwire, which talked all about it. But we got tons of people asking about what can I use as an alternative right. that is still user friendly. And the one that I would recommend to everybody is called Bleachbit. And you can find that over at bleachbit.org. Uh, Bleachbit is free. It's They also have a donation option available if you want to give them a donation for their work. But it's also open source, which is great because you'll have a lot of people looking into the source code and making sure that there isn't any malware. Yay. And the download doesn't have any junkware, which a lot of times you will get with free software, right. but open source is great. So it doesn't have any toolbars or any built-in extra applications, which sometimes you will get and is so annoying. There so I'm glad they don't have that. I will say there have been open source distribution websites that have experimented with adding in junkware installations in the installation tools. 
People so don't like it when they do that. They get really upset. So always yes. just make sure, just <laughs> go, if there's an expert or if it says like, this is the complicated individual setup that takes longer and you probably don't want it, click yeah. on that one. That's the <laughs> one that keeps you from ending up looking at your browser going, that's it's not true. my search engine. So the graphical user interface of Bleachbit, this is what it looks like in this little window right here. It is definitely not as pretty as CCleaner, but it does the job and it does it well. So it's also cross-platform. You can use it with Linux, Mac, Windows, email servers Whoa. if you want to run of those, and BlackBerry as well. So when you click on any of the options, so I'll click on one like, I'll choose VLC Media Player. It'll give you a nice little description, a little definition definition so you know what the task is going to do before you get around to deleting things you can also preview anything that it's going to delete I just cleaned up mine so it doesn't find anything that it's going to be able to recover space from and then you can choose clean once you know that everything that it's going to erase is okay with you so I click clean it's going to warn me hey that your stuff's gonna get deleted so make sure you know what you're doing and then you click delete and it cleans it up uh, I noticed just like CCleaner, cleaning junk files is very quick, it's very painless. It looks like Bleachbit does not include a registry cleaner, uh, oh. which honestly you don't really need to get into <laughs> if you're just cleaning up junk files on your computer. And a lot of people also don't recommend cleaning up your registry because you yeah. could screw up your computer. Feel free to send emails to ask at techthing.com if you are on the pro or con side of the registry cleaning conversation. <laughs> Just do it. Be nice about it. Yes, just be nice. <laughs> um, I feel safe doing that, but mm -hmm. that's because I I understand what's going on on right. the registry. But I know that if my mom was to you know try to the registry cleaner, which she you know only has a laptop and Doink she barely all. touches it. I mean, she still uses Hotmail, right. so she probably should not touch the registry cleaner herself. It's but yes, send us your recommendations on that as well. So Bleachbit also offers a shredder option, which permanently removes data or folders like uh, any music files or any photos that you want to completely delete. So this takes an even more secure approach to any of those kind of files that you don't want to just delete, but mm -hmm. you want to clear any kind of metadata out of your machine nice. as well, uh, which is very cool. I like that they include that like secure erase functionality. So I would love to know what alternatives you guys use as well if any I have always thought cleaning apps are super useful and right. I've used them since <laughs> for years as long as I've been running Windows that I can think of I just downloaded Bleachbit and got rid of five gigs of data on this Alienware laptop that I have not been using for very long uh, and it wasn't even a deep scan either it was just you know getting rid of temporary files so I know that it does the job and it does it well but of course I'm always looking for the best version of the software out there so let me know if you have any favorites ask at techthing.com or you can tweet at snubs I love utilities. Yay. They're so fun. I have a utility. What is it? <laughs> <laughs> so SD Association, which I always want to call the SD Card Association, but yeah. it's the SD Association. SD Memory Card Formatter has a oh. new version. They've got the Windows version, the Mac version. It's version 5.0. And if you've never seen us demo it on the show, it is for if you have an SD card that you can no longer read or oh, format cool. because you had a camera or a video camera or a yeah. phone or an audio device or something the weird stuff to it. Basically, you insert the card, you select the card, you hit the button, and you get the capacity back. Nice. So I would do it to this one, but I have stuff on here that I don't want to erase. <laughs> um, SDCard.org, we'll put a link in the show notes. and. It's nice because I used to have to be like, oh, I'm going to fire up a Linux Live Boot CD so I can uh -huh. access to this to format it. But with the SD Card Association Memory Card Formatter, it's free. That's cool. And I cool. can do it on Windows or Mac. That's very cool. Just saying. And you also have something new for us today. I love this web page. This is Logitech's craft web page. Oh, Create nice. in your element with craft, advanced keyboard with creative input dial. Okay. All right, I'm a little excited All here. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I get weird about keyboards. My undying love of Logitech's Harmony remotes and the Pop Smart button. Anytime you can whack the wall of your house <laughs> and like turn on a Blu-ray, oh, life I is good. I remember that thing. I love that thing. <laughs> uh, so my ears were perked when Logitech said they had a new keyboard for creatives, the Logitech Craft Advanced Keyboard. It feels heavy. Mm. It is it heavy. It is heavy. It is rich. It is sumptuous. Yes. 
It has great yes, build it quality. Is. It includes both Windows and Mac keys, which I'm really down with. Um, feels nice durable. To that. Yeah, it feels like you know, it's 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 got that like luxury car feel to it. It does. Just needs some fine Corinthian leather. But hey, a one hundred ninety nine dollar <laughs> ninety nine cents keyboard with free shipping should feel well made. If it doesn't, something's horribly wrong, uh, or you're getting some really obscure mechanical keys because you're that kind of guy or gal. So the big deal, though, on Logitech's new craft keyboard is the rotating clickable knob, also <laughs> referred to as the crown. And look, it clicks. The crown. And you can turn it. Yeah. Yes. So it's not just a volume knob, though you can use it to change the volume. Uh, once you've downloaded and installed Logitech's options software, you get to use it to interact with a selected function, which is to say it's context sensitive. So in different parts of different apps, it does different things. So yeah, if you're in Chrome or Firefox and Edge, you can use it to slide between the open tabs in your browser. But what the crown is really for, remember they called it a creative input dial, is to tweak settings in Microsoft Office or Adobe apps like Photoshop, Premiere, and all the other creative tools where you might spend a lot of your life doing things like adjusting opacity or yeah. brush sizes or scrubbing up and down tie lines. Shannon, would you say it's a bit touchy? Yes, I would say it is a bit touchy. It is very touchy. So I noticed when I was using the cute little wheelie majig up here in Adobe Premiere Pro, mm -hmm. uh, first I couldn't figure out how to turn on the clicky wheel. But once I figured it out, I noticed that it is very touchy. You just barely have to touch the top of it, the right. crown, before it'll switch from clicky mode, which you can kind of hear in my in my microphone, to the smooth action, which is called timeline navigation. Right. So if I do this in Adobe Premiere Pro, and I'll show you on my computer, so you have the jog wheel and the timeline navigation. So timeline navigation is a smooth playback on the timeline, of course, and then jog wheel gives you that clicky feel and this goes it looks like it's hits frame by frame frame by frame yeah so it's a little bit clicker but i didn't just click it down and it changed back to timeline navigation so it is very very touchy you have to be very careful i'm like i'm trying not to touch the top of it and it keeps on clicking back and forth <laughs> ah i feel like i would not use it in adobe premiere pro because it is so sensitive yeah it definitely takes it because like you know it's one of those it's it's proximity sensitive, so like the lights go on when your hands get. That's near. cool. Yeah, I like that part. Um, I think I can get used to the jog wheel because it. I apparently I am not as electric as Shannon is, and and I, it was not as <laughs> I, well. It doesn't. It's not as sensitive. They have been to shocking my, a lot of things today. So <laughs> <laughs> who knows? Um, here's the thing, though. Keyboards are above all for me for typing. Matter of fact, yes. they are for most folks. And let me be blunt. These are not my favorite keys in a keyboard. Feel good, but the key travel is very, very shallow, as in laptop shallow. Mm -hmm. And if you're like Shannon and want a wrist rest on every keyboard you own, you should know <laughs> right now that there is no wrist rest. It's um, true. <laughs> so the keys, they feel good, yes. but they feel like really amazing laptop keys because yeah. you're basically punching your fingertips into there. If you are used especially to a mechanical keyboard or membrane keyboard with a lot of travel, um, it's wireless, charges via the included USB to USB-C cable. Logitech says you'll probably be recharging it weekly. Apparently the uh, the it's knob, the crown, absorbs a lot of power. Yeah, <laughs> it didn't bother me because I just naturally, as soon as I set it up on my desktop and when I left at the end of the day, I plugged it in to mm -hmm. charge because that's the way I roll. Uh, but if you normally go weeks between charging your wireless keyboard, weekly might seem like a lot. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking around at sort of alternatives, Microsoft Surface Dial uh, is probably more sophisticated in a lot of ways and it costs half as much, but it's a Windows thing uh, and you really want to run it with a stylus. Apple's Touch Bar, uh, definitely has some more depth of integration with Adobe Suite, uh, at least according to a friend of mine who lives with the touch bar in Adobe Suite. Uh, <laughs> but it's also part of like a $500 upgrade for MacBooks. Ooh. I wish this had better keys. Mm -hmm. I type constantly. Matter of fact, most of the people I know who edit video for a living type a lot. Yes. And these keys would be epic in a laptop. They're kind of mediocre for a full-size desktop keyboard, especially given the premium $200 price where mm -hmm. it is competing with the best mechanical switches ever devised in the history of mechanical switches, except for the really old stuff from the 80s, <laughs> if you're into that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I, I still love the Harmony remotes though. Oh, I do too. I have so, a Harmony at home. It's the best thing ever. I'm just saying, not my favorite keyboard. Uh, you may, your mileage may vary, but for me, between the keys and the kind of limited functionality on this, I'm gonna s turn this off before <laughs> As I you're erase scrolling that through my timeline. video <laughs> that Shannon was at. 
The wireless works great. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently. Oh, my goodness. Let us know what you think, and if you have alternatives to choose from as well, ask at techthing.com or tweet at Patrick Norton. Please do. We love your questions. Seriously. You hate email? That's okay. Tweet at techthing, at snubs, or at Patrick Norton. And hey, if you could spare a moment or two to give our video the thumbs up on YouTube or like our Facebook page or tell a friend about Tech Thing, we would be grateful. And as always, patreon.com slash techthing is your way to help keep the show ad-free and get your eyes and ears on special content that only goes out to our patrons. That's patreon.com slash techthing. Thank you so much for supporting Shannon and I and Tech Thing, no matter how you do it. We got an email from Angry Mosfet who wrote ask at techthing.com. Greetings and salutations to good people of Tech Thing. One quick question. I was just about to start thinking about building a new gaming PC, but suddenly I became a video producer by accident. Uh -oh. So I have to ask, what are the rules of thumb for building a video editing machine? Some say I need the best CPU. Some say that all of the RAM is most important. Others claim that GPU power is very important as well. Which is it then? All of it. Everything I intend to render is 1080p. 4K is abstract to me, so I need to build something that will not exceed 800 bucks. I'm reusing my old SSD, case, drives, etc., and I wonder how to proceed. My current PC is almost 11 years old, so I am a bit out of the loop when it comes to hardware. <laughs> All I want to do on it is photo editing, video editing, and occasional gaming. My less edits were done on a loaner laptop with a screen size of 11.6 inches, so I am used to hell on earth, and yet researching this subject is beyond me. I want to experience video editing while sober. Impossible so far. <laughs> so please help. Much obliged in advance from Angry MOSFET. 11.3 inches? You can edit what? on a sub 12 inch monitor. I mean, this one's 13 inches and I can edit pretty well on here, but 11, wow. You can also skateboard from San Francisco to Sacramento. Doable, <laughs> just not recommended. Yeah. Oh my goodness. It's always easier when you have a full on PC for editing. Yeah, uh, and you pretty much nailed it angry uh, with all of it. Uh, in terms of video editing, personally, I would rank it CPU, yes. then memory, then GPU. Fortunately for you, the nice folks at AMD decided to pull the rug out from under the cost of buying lots and lots of CPU cores, which is exactly what you need for video editing. Um, Yay! Now, I thought it might just be me that was kind of all excited about AMD Ryzen, and then I went over to, to our friend Ryan, mm -hmm. uh, PCPro.com. The, they do the PCPro.com slash leaderboard, and I, it wasn't until I took a look and realized that they actually recommend AMD Ryzen 3, 5, and 7 for their $500, $1,000, wow. and $1,500 PC builds. So it cool. is not just me, and Ryzen has seen all the processors. So if you're, if you're doing something that is multi-threaded, you are with video editing, yep. uh, for the same money, you will get more cores. That's a big deal. Uh, AMD Ryzen 5, 1600, is 210 bucks, six cores, 12 threads. It's the heart of a good $1,000 system. In your case, because you're recycling SSDs and stuff, you're at an advantage. Uh, if you can swing it, an AMD Ryzen 7, 1700, 290 bucks would be the heart of an outstanding kind of what would normally be a $1,500 build. Mm -hmm. That is a fantastic processor. I'm personally running on my primary desktop in 1800X, uh, which is kind of the most expensive consumer processor that AMD makes, but it also reduced my rendering times by a unbelievable amount. Oh, so wow. I get to go home earlier. That's um, so cool. <laughs> for 1080p editing, 16 gigabytes minimum, 32 gigabytes is recommended. Pretty much all you need for 1080p. Uh, a GTX 1070 would be nice, yeah. um, but I would save money on the GPU if you're on a budget and upgrade later when prices settle. Because if you take a look at, at GPU prices now, as the, as the price of Bitcoin and yeah. Ethereum mining became more valuable and over the GPUs. summer, GPU prices started to get squirrely. Yeah. And now in theory this summer with AMD releasing the, the, the Radeon Vega 56 and 64, we were hoping to see prices come down, but they sold out almost immediately. So even if you want an AMD Radeon 56, which would be the better $400 GPU compared to a 1070, you probably can't find one for oh, anything man. near the, the recommend or the, you know, the retail, what should be the retail price for that mm -hmm. and rumor has it that's not going to change until November so between the lack of competition and the Bitcoin mayhem or to say the Ethereum mining or the mining mayhem uh, speculative mining GPU PC build mayhem it's kind of expensive to buy a GPU right now Come on, Bitcoiners if you want to see a really nice summary of kind of what different cards and boards do for a video build Puget Systems has a great page recommended systems for Adobe Premiere Pro where they actually walk you in this case it's all Intel stuff but they walk you through an Intel Core i7 with six cores up through an Intel Core i9 with 12 cores and they you get to look at the 
the performance increase increase from a four hundred dollar so ten seventy cool. to a thousand dollar you know Titan XP. Uh, they talk about RAM recommendations, uh, storage, and all sorts of good stuff. So props to Puget Systems for making all that information super easy to access. <laughs> Yay! And again, CPU, memory, and GPU. If like mm -hmm. if you don't have the money, get whatever GPU you can get now and then upgrade later. That's my thoughts on the matter. Time's coming for us to build our own editing rig here in the studio as an upgrade from what we currently have, which is apparently running some pretty old wares inside of there. So <laughs> I am ready to do an upgrade. What do you think, Patrick? Oh, yes. <laughs> we will upgrade all of the things. Got an email from Happy Hacker who writes, three, two, one, say cheese. Guess what? My SSD just went stiff on me about a week after your last backup prompt episode. I do keep my backups up to date, but just for the sake of it, I decided to back up after I watched the show. Who would have thought? Love the show. It reminds me why tech and tinkering is awesome. Keep it going. Cheers, Happy Hacker. Oh, that's awesome. so great. Told you, somebody wow. out there would have a hard drive that would die. Yeah, it's it's true. Every single time we do a backup episode, I'm like, hmm, I should make sure that my spider oak backup is working as it should. So on that night note, I also had a backup scenario this weekend that I wanted to mention. <sighs> my Synology DS416 Slim started continually beeping at me one day. <laughs> Exactly. It was so annoying. I could not log into the admin interface to uh -oh. see what was going on. It wasn't even being able to be seen on my network, so my network couldn't see it. And I just left it like that for like a month or two because I just didn't have time to troubleshoot the thing. I was just like, I can't deal with this right now. I have DEF CON coming up. I just And you've I got off-site backups. So I do. Worry about it. Yeah, I have Spider Oak cloud backups. So I wasn't too worried, especially since I know those are backing up correctly. So finally, I took the time this weekend to fix it, and I'm so happy that I did. So the first thing that I had to do was hit the reset button on the back of it to reset the NAS, and they have a little walkthrough on the website about this, but mine, I didn't necessarily stick to this walkthrough exactly. So it just had to reset the login credentials and the net network credentials on my... Uh, so it doesn't reset it like wipe everything. You can have it do that if you need to, but in my case, I just needed to reset the network and the login okay. credentials so I could actually get onto the thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so this does vary depending on which kind of Synology NAS that you own. Just keep that in mind. Important safety tip. <laughs> yeah. Because it's, well, I mean, we're laughing here, but right, there's nothing more awkward than going to reset something like, oh, it locked up and I want to reset it, and finding out you've just Wipe wiped out. your entire operating system on the NAS, and yeah, the which data. you can do that if you do it incorrectly. Awkward. <laughs> so when, once I was able to log into the admin interface, since the network credentials were fixed, I opened up the storage manager and I figured out that one of the drives was degraded. Hmm. So this thing that I have, it's four drives, four bays, and I have four one terabyte drives in it. And luckily, I just had to follow the steps on this page to repair the degraded disk. So I just walk through these steps and it'll let you know which one is uh, repairable and if you can repair it yourself. So luckily mine is in a RAID 1 format, so the disks are mirrored. Oh, wow. So all it had to do was repair the degraded disk based on the format and files available on the mirrored disk. So that's all it did, and it fixed it. Oh, wow. And the entire repair process probably took me maybe an hour or two. So just had to copy the data over from these two drives to these two drives. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So it, it didn't last very long. I didn't have much backed up, so it didn't take that long to fix it, to the, do the repair. Uh, if I did have one terabyte full of storage on one of those drives, it would have taken much longer for yeah. that to actually repair itself. But I'm very, very happy that they had a good walkthrough and I was able to experience fixing my first NAS. Dead NAS, yeah. not so dead. <laughs> I'm curious, having spent a lot of time bouncing around with RAID 5 and Drobos, uh, which take a lot longer than copying the data to restore the data, I ask you, gentle creatures of the audience. Yay. Creatures, people, <laughs> gentle people of the audience. What's the longest it ever took you to restore uh, dead drives on a NAS or on a Drobo or whatever crazy box you're working with? Email askatechthing.com. We're really curious. <laughs> And remember, once in a while, put down the phone, step away from the screen, close the laptop, and do something analog, like go down and play by the docks. 
Sounds so <laughs> naughty when you say it that way. No, really, I'm talking about touring some ships. I, I got the chance to go to the Maritime Museum of San Diego. It is one of my new favorites ever. They have 11 ships on display, starting with the Star of wow. India, the world's oldest active sailing ship that was built in 1863. It is gorgeous. The USS Dolphin, which Ooh. is the deepest diving submarine ever. The B-39, a Soviet Foxtrot-class diesel electric sub that was actually involved in some crazy potential nuclear mayhem <laughs> that fortunately didn't happen. Wow. Yeah, it's a crazy story. Well, it, it, it happened like around the Bay of Pigs, but nobody knew about it until almost 25, 30 years no later way. because of secrecy. The Steam Ferry Berkeley, uh, it's an 1898 steam ferry boat that operated in the San Francisco Bay for over 60 years. That's cool. A swift boat, recreations of the HMS Surprise, and the San Salvador, which was the first European boat to reach America's west coast. I cannot believe they sailed that thing around the Atlantic and around the Horn. Wow. Uh, the original was built in 1542. They they had extra large huevos. The California, <laughs> a recreation of an 1847 revenue cutter, the C.W. Lawrence, and quite a few more, plus museum displays. They do trips on the boats, and there's at least a couple of coyotes scattered around oh, there. Oh, that's so great. Don't ask me why. <laughs> SDMaritime.org is the website. If you're headed to San Diego, check it out. 20 bucks per uh, adult, and oh, it that's not is bad. awesome. That's cool. I was Thanks great. for sharing. It was me and Mubix. Oh, no way. Running around the boats. Oh, right, for TorCon. I How cannot fun. imagine living on a submarine. So if you are a current or former bubble head, you got my respect. That <laughs> stuff's, I, no. To all the Marines in my lifetime, good peoples. Thanks for your, thanks for your service. I'm Adam Norton. I'm Shannon Morse. We'll see you next week on Tech Thing. That's interesting about Marines and submarines. Marines and submarines. Well, I have Navy, I have Navy and Marines in my in my family. So my, I should thank both of them for their service. My dad's aircraft carrier, the USS Hornet, is actually a museum on Alameda Island where we live now. USS Hornet. Yeah. That's the one that was picking up the uh, Apollo astronauts. Yeah. There was a Morse on there. I don't know if I'm related. It's like what? Oh. Yeah. I was like, I was saying a Morse, like Morse code. My brother. Morse. I was like, oh, Morse last name. Yeah, like, last name Morse. My like private hard. Morse. <laughs> I think it was private. I don't know. But my brother told me about that. But I, I, I have yet to look it up. So I need to find out more. I need to find a place. Google where, it. Well, I tried to Google it, and it was really hard to find information on like what, what crew it was exactly right. that picked up the Apollo. Because that's what I want to find out. Ah! Ah! If y'all know where I should look, let me know. Probably, actually, you know what? They, I think they actually have information on the phone itself. On oh, the okay. Maybe so I should just go there and ask them. <laughs>